Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Irby. Um, and then just for the podcast, I'll introduce myself. I'm with the Infectious Disease Associates of Tampa Bay, so um, the private practice group here. And um, you've already heard some transplant topics, but I decided uh, to put sort of my own perspective on it a little bit and um, try not to repeat sort of what you guys have already heard, because I know you've already done CMV and um, some bone marrow transplant stuff as well. So I really want it to be practical. So there's really two practical uh, ways that you guys need to be aware of transplant patients. Number one, and really what it's all about is patient care. So in two arenas, one uh, here as a fellow, and then when you're out in the real world, when you're in um, you know, a different academic center, this academic center, if you're in a non-academic center, you are gonna see transplant patients. So it's good to be sort of aware of how transplant works. And then the other practical issue for you guys right now is board questions. Um, I actually don't remember very many board questions on solid organ transplant, but there's a few key points that I think would make good questions, so I'll sort of point those out as we go along. Um, my perspective is solid organ transplant. I'm here at Tampa General uh, Medical Group, and I see mostly hearts, livers, and kidneys, which are definitely the easier of the solid organ transplants. You get into lungs, which are done here and uh, difficult, or you, uh, small bowel is not done here, but it's also very challenging. So um, we'll tackle uh, heart, liver, and kidney, but I'm not gonna really separate them because there's a lot of generalizations that you can uh, uh, just say about solid organ transplants. So I'm not gonna get into all the nitty gritty details. So uh, where is all this information coming from? So uh, Tampa General and uh, my group, specifically Dr. Kansu and Dr. Mayer, and uh, some of the USFID attending, specifically Dr. Montero and Dr. Alraba, all sat around and really put together some uh, pretty high quality, uh, very useful, um, uh, user-friendly transplant service ID protocol. So the transplant teams were asking us, can we get some protocols so that everybody's on the same page? And so that actually was put together last year and those are complete. Um, it's a significant uh, document. It's about 100 pages. And so uh, we have it in electronic form. So I think you can get it in electronic form, maybe from Tammy or Dr. Montero, or Dr. Alraba, if you want to read it, it's actually pretty good. These were adapted from the national um, the American Society of Transplantation, who did a very similar um, review of all the guidelines, and they published it in one separate journal. That was their one issue for March 2013, which is fantastic. So they have all the they have all the data, they have all the uh, references, and that's sort of a national guideline to help us. And so what we did was we took those guidelines and sort of adapted them to what we actually do here. And then uh, again, on a practical standpoint, the transplant team is a very helpful team. So these patients are not your um, sort of run-of-the-mill patients. These patients are very loved. There are people who love these patients. So whenever you come across a transplant patient, they have a coordinator who knows them inside and out. They know where they live. They know their kids' names. They know when their birthday is. They know what pharmacy they go to. They know what type, what, um, you know, what time of day they take their medicines. And um, these Transplant coordinators are very helpful because if you want to know something about them, like like they had a transplant 10 years ago, but I don't know what their CMV serology is, you can call them and they'll know. Um, they also want to hear from you. So if they send a patient to you in an outpatient ID clinic and um, you see them, they want to know what you're thinking because they, they keep track on uh, their patients. They're also the ones who immediately around the time of transplant coordinates all the serologies so uh, from, the, from the donor. So they're the ones who are gonna follow up on the donor serologies. If anything interesting or active comes up from the donor, it's gonna be the transplant coordinator that's gonna um, relay that to you. And then they all, of course, have an attending physician who knows and loves them very well, uh, too, and they're always very happy uh, and excited to talk to us because they really do value our opinion. So just a little bit of what I'm going to get into, um, pre-transplant versus post-transplant. So pre-transplant, uh, it's our sort of history and physical deform you guys have actually seen. I'm going to go through that a little bit. Uh, serologies, which are complex and uh, lengthy, um, but also, of course, valuable. And then vaccine strategies. 
And then uh, post-transplant evaluation, there's uh, timing of infection, which I think will be helpful for you guys clinically. So as far as history, you guys have seen this list uh, when you see a transplant patient. You want to know where they were born. Uh, were they born in uh, the, the Midwest United States, the Southwest United States? Were they born in Nicar Nicaragua and had a family member die of tuberculosis? Were they born in Africa and exposed to all kinds of things? People were born all, all kinds of places and they come here and, and people live here and then get sick. And so um, there's a lot of these relevant old history that you can get just from asking that one question. Um, travel, the same sort of idea, people travel all over the place. Um, pets or animals? Do they work on a Do they work on a farm? Do they Do they milk their own goats? Do they uh, skin rabbits? I've actually met a patient who farmed and skinned rabbits. He wasn't a transplant patient, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Do they, you know, hunt and skin their own meat? So those are all risk factors too. Type of water is um, the risk factor. Uh, well water is a slightly higher risk of um, uh, infections just because you don't have that sterilization through the city system. Uh, TB exposure, vaccine history, blood transfusions, basically for CMV uh, risk factor. Uh, people who have a lot of blood transfusions have a much higher rate of being CMV IgG positive. And then uh, if they have any interesting employment situation or hobbies or um, a prior splenectomy will be in their past medical history, but that's nice to know for vaccine reasons. So here's the long list of serologies that everybody has seen. And um, these will all be done per protocol by the transplant coordinator. So you don't have to worry about ordering these. These are probably actually gonna be ordered and partially resulted when you see the patient. And I'm gonna go through them one at a time. And what do you do with them? So this is long, but you know, they're gonna be abnormal every once in a while. So sometimes positive is abnormal, sometimes negative is abnormal. So if you have a positive strongyloides IgG, just treat them. It's a piece of cake. People tolerate the ivermectin really well. You treat them for two days and then again in two weeks. Um, if you have uh, some of the viral serologies negative, then uh, vaccinate them if they are able. If you have a hep C antibody or an HIV antibody positive, do a PCR, see if it's an active disease or not. And then for hepatitis C, treat them because actually within the last six months, the treatment options for hepatitis C are fantastic, so there's no reason not to treat a person for hepatitis C before transplant, and, um, or to exclude them for hepatitis C, just treat them. And then HIV, we do not do HIV positive transplants here at this center, but Miami does, for example, so you can refer them to uh, a separate center. Hepatitis B is extremely confusing, um, but the bottom line is anybody with a hepatitis B core antibody or surface antigen that are positive, even if they don't have active disease, you have to assume that they have latent hepatitis, and when you immune suppress them, they're gonna reactivate. So um, you want them to have a hepatitis B surface antibody, which shows that they are protected with a protective antibody. If you can't get them to form an antibody with a vaccine, then, um, they're not an acceptable transplant candidate. And so that's really, that's actually come up, I've seen that. It's really hard to tell a patient, I'm sorry, you're gonna die of heart failure because you can't get a transplant because you had hepatitis C in your past, or hepatitis B. Um, and uh, vaccinate for hepatitis B surface antibody negative, even somebody who's never had the disease. And then uh, for reference, you're gonna wanna do EBV, HSV, Toxo, and CMV so that uh, you'll note for the prophylaxis for some of them and reference for others. Um, treat latent TB uh, and syphilis. And then your special circumstances, um, you know, do you live in the Southwest? Do you live in the, 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 the Midwest United States? So those are the same, um, the same questions that you've already asked them and these are sort of the organisms that you're looking for. There is an interesting sort of side note in that if somebody's at risk for schistosoma, actually the recommendation is to do a um, urine ONP and a cystoscopy. I haven't seen that before, but that is in the recommendations and in the guidelines. So for vaccination, you really do want to vaccinate everybody pre-transplant and really ideally before they're sick. So somebody who's in um, end-stage heart failure, 
in fluorid CHF on the ventilator in the ICU is not really a good person to vaccinate. You really would like to vaccinate them as soon as you meet them, as soon as people start talking about um, uh, transplantation. The same with kidney failure. If somebody's referred for chronic kidney disease and they're not on dialysis yet, which happens rarely but does happen, you want to vaccinate them before dialysis because people on dialysis don't have as good of an immune response to vaccines. If you can't vaccinate them or don't get a chance to vaccinate them before their transplant, then the recommendation is to wait six months because that's after the immune suppression um, is down to maintenance levels. So if you vaccinate them immediately after, it's not going to work, so you're wasting your time. Live viruses are special and um, they're, they, you need to wait four weeks from a time of vaccine to transplant. Um, and so this is, I think, I have three board question opportunities. So I think this is a good board question opportunity. Um, you have a, uh, uh, a patient who uh, got a live virus vaccine, when can I transplant them? Well, you have to wait a month. And you don't wanna vaccinate somebody who's sick, who's at the, who's at the close to transplant, because you're gonna mess it up. You're gonna be the one who's like, oh, I'm sorry I gave them the shingles vaccine and now they can't get a transplant for a month and they'll miss their window and that's not a very nice thing to do. So a live virus you really have to be careful about in the timing of and if they're close to transplant just forget it. And then of course it's contraindicated after transplant so that's a little bit of a tricky situation and sometimes you you miss a vaccine opportunity. You, you meet, these, meet, meet these people too late and you can't vaccinate them for everything. Typical vaccines that you want to ask about when you meet them. Influenza, everybody needs a yearly influenza vaccine. Pneumococcal is the same as um, general population, so Prevnar, Pneumovax, and that's sort of been hashed around. We've heard that schedule multiple times. Tdap, if you don't remember or don't have documentation, just do it again. And there's actually, there's actually some suggestion that we really should have a very low threshold to do that again because um, uh, there's been some, uh, especially the pertussis, part may not be as active as it was at the beginning of when you were vaccinated. Um, hepatitis B is interesting because we do an accelerated schedule for people who are surface antibody negative and it's um, a high dose so um, four times the normal dose and it's 0, 7, and 21 days and a booster at 12 months. So the goal is to really try and vaccinate these people before they get transplant because if you wait the whole six months you're never going to finish the vaccine series. And then you can check a hepatitis B surface antibody four weeks after and re-vaccinate if it doesn't take. Hepatitis, I'm sorry, um, HPV uh, is recommended and that's either before or after transplant. So that one um, you can give after as well. Is there a age cutoff? The... Um, you know, there, there is historically an age cutoff, and so it would be the same um, for transplant, but that age cutoff is sort of fading, and there's a lot of recommendations that you probably don't need that. And actually, I do think for transplant, it's, it's everybody. And then family members need to have the same rules. So they all need to be vaccinated and no live viruses within four weeks of transplant. Your asplenia history that you got when you met your patient, just like any patient, that you see who doesn't have a spleen, they need to be vaccinated against pneumococcus, meningococcus, and haemophilus. So your transplant patients certainly are not an exception, so they need these vaccines too if they do not have a spleen. You're going to be asked to clear somebody for transplant. So this is kind of um, a lot of responsibility because you're being asked, you know, is it safe to transplant this person? And to be honest, it usually is safe from an infectious disease standpoint. Usually they don't have any big infectious disease contraindication. It's um, sort of just some red tape they have to go through, do some paperwork. But every once in a while you'll find somebody that really is not a good transplant candidate. And it's not about you know, doing what's right because it's what's on paper. It's about doing what's right for the patient. So if we can accurately predict that somebody is gonna have a poor outcome from an infectious disease reason, those are the patients that we don't want to transplant. So examples are an active bacterial infection, so if they're actively bacteremic, if they have an active pneumonia, if they have active tuberculosis, this is not a good time to transplant them. You need to get their infection under control. And um, at Tampa General, we don't transplant HIV patients. 
Um, that may change in the future, but as of right now, that is uh, the protocol here. And then active hepatitis B or hepatitis C are contraindications for transplant, except for liver transplant, where it actually may be an indication. Um, and then what to do with the hepatitis B or the C after transplant is a whole nother uh, discussion. The transplant team wants you to say no infectious disease contraindication for transplant or cleared for transplant, whatever you want, but that's the phrase they're going to want to say. Um, they also want your recommendations on what vaccines uh, need to be done uh, because uh, that's a little bit of a confusing subject as well. If they do have some infectious disease reason why you can't transplant them, for example, bacteremia, then they will be deactivated, which means status 1A or 1B to status 7. So that's just a terminology thing. So 1A means top priority in the hospital. So those are the patients that are in the ICU um, on you know, mechanical ventilation or on uh, vasopressor support that cannot go home. Or status 1B are people who are very sick and end stage but are actually compensated enough that they can be home. And then status 7 is a temporary deactivation for another medical reason. Latent TB came up for me recently. So um, I was asked to clear a patient who had a positive quantifier on gold who was from Colombia and who had a family member with active tuberculosis about five years ago. So this sounds like actual real latent TB. And so, uh, you know, what do you need to do about this? Quantifiron gold is a, tr is a test of choice. We don't really do PPD anymore, and that's sort of becoming true everywhere. Quantifiron gold is just a nice test. Um, so you do need to treat for latent TB if you have a positive quantifiron gold. If you have a close, re especially a recent tuberculosis contact or high-risk situation, and then a recipient of a transplant from a donor with active tuberculosis, which I've, again, not seen, but, you know, this could come up. And you're, we're going to talk about in a minute, you know, infectious disease contraindications to be a donor, and to active tuberculosis is one of them. But every once in a while, someone will die, and they don't seem to have an infection, and then they do an autopsy, and you find, oh, I guess they had tuberculosis, and so you'll get that call, and, um, and then you can treat your patient. So treatment options are the standard nine month of INH or the four months of rifampin and rifapentin. These are all fine. And then you just treat through transplant. So you put them on the you put them on treatment and you say nine months no matter what, four months no matter what. So whatever you decide to do. And latent tuberculosis in its own right is not an absolute contraindication for transplant. So you can transplant a person with a positive quantifier on gold. The patient just needs to be aware that they have a higher risk of reactivating tuberculosis. And, um, and then as, as soon as you meet them, put them on treatment, their risk will drop. So this is tiny. So it says infectious considerations in the evaluation of potential organ donors. So these are patients who are not a good organ donor. So encephalitis, meningitis of unknown etiology, untreated or incompletely treated encephalitis, um, and that's for, like, creutzfeldt jakobs uh, Jacob's disease, uh, rabies. These are the patients that, you know, those are the case reports where somebody died of an unknown reason. They thought it was a stroke and they ended up having rabies. And everybody got rabies and died. You know, you've heard those stories, everybody who received those organs. Um, an active uh, viral infection, an active bacterial infection, and an active parasitic infection will disqualify somebody from being a donor. Again, sometimes they may find out later that they had an infection and you will get a call about that and you need to treat your patients accordingly. For example, you know, Mrs. X had a heart transplant yesterday and the blood cultures from her donor are now back positive for gram positive coccyne clusters. Okay, well I'm gonna put her on vancomycin because we need to know what that is and then we usually treat bacteremic patients about two weeks from the time of their transplant. And then you have your um, reactivation of infections that you're already carrying with you. So it's the same ones that you're screening for and trying to reduce the risk of before you get transplanted. So this is a part of your pre-transplant evaluation. And then your donor-derived infections, um, the list overlaps somewhat. So you can have CMV before or after, you can have toxic before or after. And there have been cases of, doc of transmitted anything. Fill in the blank, it's been documented. 
to be transmitted via uh, an organ. And so this is all part of the organ donor screening and that follow-up that you're going to get from your transplant coordinator. <coughs> so here's a list of donor-derived infections that have been documented. So it's, you know, herpes virus, HIV, West Nile, rabies, um, all kinds of bacterial infections, including tuberculosis, syphilis, meningococcus, fungal infections, and parasitic infections. So as far as post-transplant, uh, timing is important and helpful. So uh, it really divides nicely into the first month, one to six months, and more than six months. So the first month is obviously uh, very unique in that you are both very recently out from a very significant surgery, so you're at risk from sur surgical complications, line sepsis, hematoma uh, infections, uh, surgical site infections, and your risk for acute acquisition of something from your donor, and your acute risk of reactivation of your own infection because the immune suppression is more severe in the first month. So there's a lot of um, effort to go out of the way to help reduce a lot of these risks. So um, regular infections, pneumonia, surgical site infections, um, bacteria from your prior colonizations because you've been sick in and out of the hospital. One to six months actually right now with all of our prophylaxis strategies is currently the time you're at most risk for your opportunistic infection because this is the time that you're tapering off your immune suppressant, I mean, you're tapering off your uh, prophylactic medication. So you're tapering off your valsite, you're tapering off your septra, and um, you're still on significant immune, um, um, immune suppression. So that's a careful balance. So these are your classic time frame for your uh, opportunistic infection. So toxoplasmosis, uh, CMV. CMV keeps getting mentioned because it really is one of the major things that you have to worry about. And then more, six, more than six months, you're sort of almost like a normal person, you know, like a non-transplant person, um, almost but not quite. You're still at risk for a um, more severe community-acquired illness, um, and then you are slightly more at risk for these bizarre things, but not nearly as much as you were earlier in your course. I really, uh, I, there was a lecture when I was a fellow that, um, a lecturer that pointed out that just because you're a transplant patient and you're at risk for all these weird things, you're not immune to normal infections. You're not immune to community-acquired pneumonia. You're not immune to cellulitis. You're not immune to urinary tract infection. And in fact, those still are the most common, um, common infections that you're going to see in a post-transplant patient. So you see a patient with a cough, an infiltrate, a fever. They've been sick for two days. This is community-acquired pneumonia. Treat them for community-acquired pneumonia. If they don't get better, then you have to delve in more and uh, worry about these unusual things that they may have gotten as well. And then just a quick note on viruses can be co-pathogen. So it has been well documented that you can get aspergillus after um, RSV infection, PCP well documented after CMV pneumonitis, and then the other way around, Epstein-Barr virus um, is you know, the causative pathogen of post-transplant lympho lymphoproliferative disorder. And then as uh, you guys heard a big CMB lecture back in December, you get upregulation of um, histocompatibility antigens, increased risk of graft rejection with CMV reactivation, and then of course the oncogenesis well known with viruses. So here's my next board question opportunities. Um, you have a patient who had a heart transplant four months ago, CMV mismatch, mismatch toxo, uh, positive IgG prior, no travel, no sick contacts, no suspicious foods, presents with GI complaints, abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, and colitis. If your workup's otherwise negative, including CMV PCR, the, the question, you know, this is sort of a what am I thinking question, but the point is you still have to rule out CMV colitis. So CMV colitis is still very much on the list even though your serum PCR is negative and that is um, diagnosed by a colonoscopy. My second board question opportunity is a patient, gram-negative rod, septic shock, rapid multi-system organ failure 24 hours after transplant. That one, and I have all the answers here. That one you really need to have on your list, strongyloides, because that's your, you know, super hyperinfection where gram-negative rods are being pulled all over the place. 
So those I think are, they wouldn't be a much longer question obviously, but I think those are good opportunities where you might see a transplant case on the boards. I used to remember my board questions, but I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Here's a long list of CMV and transplant recipients. I included that just because CMV is like the number one thing that you deal with after transplant. And uh, it's, a big, it's a big clinical issue from a medical standpoint and from a uh, uh, you know, patient quality of life standpoint. It really is difficult. You know, and it's, it's sort of interesting. You have patients that are CMV negative and then you give them a CMV in their organ, now they're mismatched or they're at the highest risk. But they're going to die of their organ disease. They're going to die of CHF. They're going to die of liver failure. So you don't really have CMV is so common in the population that it really doesn't make sense to limit those um, to, to limit those organs. And then just be aware in your transplant patients, they're not going to have as severe a clinical illness as a non-transplant patient. So you need to have a low threshold to do imaging and to do a biopsy, cystology, and really get a diagnosis because a differential diagnosis is going to be huge and you're going to want to narrow it down quickly, get a firm diagnosis so that you can treat it. Because if it's something strange, like a fungus versus an AFB for lung infection, for example, the treatment is very, very different. So make your diagnosis first, however you need to do that, and then you can proceed with, um, then you can proceed with treatment. Um, and then just a reminder that serology is very helpful pre-transplant, but after transplant, you're gonna have false negatives, and then you need to go to PCR, culture biopsy, et cetera. So, um, right, I'm getting towards the end. As far as transplant resources when you're seeing transplant patients, transplant ID is hard. So we can talk about transplant all day for days and weeks on end and still be more to talk about for transplant. So you're gonna run into situations that are complicated and we already have a lot of resources. So the number one resource when you see a complicated transplant patient are gonna be your colleagues and um, people that you trained with. So anybody here, any USF attending, any one of us in our group, we would be happy to talk to anybody anytime, especially when you're out in some place weird and you see some weird situation. Infectious disease doctors are really nice. So you can call anybody, you know a thousand infectious disease doctors. So for transplant issues or any other issue, you know, utilize the resources out of your colleagues. Um, at any transplant center, especially here, the transplant pharmacists are fantastic. They're very helpful as far as dosing. Um, they know the protocols inside and out and the transplant coordinators are really nice for other patient issues. And then here's my references. Um, American Journal of Transplantation, it's really fantastic. Um, it's about 300 pages, but it's a really nicely laid out resource. So if you have a very specific issue, you can get it online, pull it up, pull up what you need to look at. It's very good. Our transplant protocols here are fantastic as well as far as exactly what to do when, prophylaxis, charts, um, treatment, when things change as far as prophylaxis. And um, we need to figure out how to make sure you guys have access to those. And then, um, of course, cdc.gov has all uh, recommendations for vaccines for general uh, population and uh, transplant patients. So that's it for me. Thank you, guys. <laughs>